So, just to balance the talk from last night about contentment, I wanted to talk about what may be perceived as its opposite, which is the very wonderful, noble truth of suffering. But not only suffering, the cause of suffering, because the Buddha said there is a cause or there is a a rising of suffering and there's something that causes that suffering to arise, and also the way to end suffering, the cessation of suffering, which could be seen as happiness, the opposite side of The cessation of suffering, of course, is again contentment, deep, lasting, unconditional peace, and the way to the end of suffering. So I'm just going to go over these fairly briefly, because I also want to get on to defining happiness. So first we need to see what isn't happiness in order to understand and have a clearer um, definition of what is. And the Buddha said it's very important to define happiness too. So this is a happy path, it's not a path of suffering. And for me personally, when I first heard the noble truth of suffering, it was a huge relief. Because until then, I'd been thinking perhaps there was something wrong with me, you know. Perhaps other people thought that it was normal to be born into this world, into this body, you know, into all the suffering that we encounter through our body. You know, I'd see the news when I was a teenager about the wars and, you know, the greed involved in that and the struggles for power. And I just couldn't understand, you know, how people could be so cruel But also I asked myself, what's the point of all this? You know, if it's just to amass more and more material wealth, what exactly is the point? And so many beings are harmed in the meantime. So I wanted to find a compassionate response to that. But the big stumbling block for me was that I felt there was something wrong with me for feeling this way because no one around me could understand why I was suffering. There was nothing particularly wrong in my life. It was an ordinary life. I had a nice upbringing. There were days of contentment on the lawn when I was a child with the wood pigeons, coo-coo, coo-coo, in the in- green and pleasant land of England. <laughs> so, you know, I had some idyllic memories of childhood, but somehow when I became a teenager, I started asking, you know, why am I really here? It's very hard for me to decide what I want to study and what to do with the rest of my life if I don't even know that. You know, there was a basic question there that was really eating me, and I wanted an answer to it. So when I heard that the Buddha said that, you know, there is suffering, and it's quite normal to suffer, part of that suffering was already taken away, because I realized that it's the idea that we shouldn't suffer that causes most of the pain. Once we can accept that this is an integral (coughs) part of life, you know, and it's normal, And there's a reason for it, because by suffering, it can activate a wish to be free from that suffering. So that's the reason that the Buddha pointed out how and why we suffer. He wanted to rouse this wish, this inclination, this um, yearning, in a way, to end suffering and to find lasting peace. So he didn't just say, well, this is suffering, tough luck, get on with it, you know, birth and death, well, you're sort of born into it, there's nothing you can do. He actually said, no, there's a cause. So he was um, compared sometimes to a doctor who, you know, you go to the doctor, they diagnose your disease. And it's very frustrating when you ask, you know, why? I had a disease, a very chronic disease, which is slowly getting better. And I used to ask, why do I have so much acid? Oh, well, mm, because, you know, your body's producing too much acid. Take these acid-inhibiting drugs and you'll be fine. And it's like, yes, but where's the acid coming from and why? And they couldn't answer that. And so, of course, they couldn't find a cure. I was just taking pills, which were symptomatic relief. But the Buddha actually was a great physician in the sense that he discovered a cause and he gave a solution, he gave a remedy. So the Eightfold Path can be seen as a kind of turning point where we can start to transition from suffering to happiness. And all of these factors of the Eightfold Path, right view, right intention, right speech, (coughs) right livelihood, right action, right effort or endeavor, right mindfulness and right samadhi, right stillness. Why are they right? What does it mean right? Are we being sort of religiously pious? It just means right in the sense that they're leading out of suffering and into happiness. And in that sense, they're right. They're right if your aim is enlightenment. They're right if you want to walk the noble path. This is the way to do it. Yeah? And so we start to align our practice with the Eightfold Path. So, yeah, Ajahn Chah has a nice little quote. He says, um, if you haven't wept, you haven't really begun your practice. So sometimes this suffering is like the stimulation, you know, for us to begin. 
And the Buddha wasn't denying that some pleasure to be found in the world, but he did say of the sensual pleasure, that's the pleasure that we get through the physical touch, through our eyes, nose, smell, etc., etc. I think you all know what sensual pleasure means. Right? It's not the pleasure of the mind yet. Like There is a deeper pleasure of the mind that you can experience in meditation. But the sensual pleasure is much more exciting, stimulating, and immediate in a sense. And he said that there is a gratification there. We all know what that is. I mean, I, I, my heart lifted when I saw the food going into the oven this morning. Huge trays of lovely roast vegetables with really nice olive oil, just to make you hungry. <laughs> but, you know, the problem with these things is not that we have to condemn them you know, morally, and so, oh, it's wrong to enjoy my lunch. It's not wrong. You can eat it with a certain purpose. You want to nourish your body so that you can practice to end suffering, finally, right? You know that's not the ultimate end of suffering, because after you've finished your lunch, you might have stomach ache, you might need to go to the toilet, or you might get hungry again in the next half hour if you didn't take quite enough, right? Or you might have overeaten. That's probably more likely. (laughs) So he said, you know, that the problem with these uh, types of pleasure is that they change. They're not permanent or lasting or reliable. Another translation of impermanence is unreliable, Mm -hmm. unstable. And we lose them. Another thing is that the um, this kind of after effects sometimes outweigh the pleasure that you had in the first place. You know, it's easy to see that with things like alcohol. You just feel terrible the next day. Big headache, hangover, cloudy mind, can't meditate. You know, it's the antithesis to developing a calm and clear, bright, awake mind. Yeah. He also called them a debt. You have to pay it back later. And there was a story I heard about um, a young monk in Thailand many, many years ago. So I'm sure he's not a monk now. Well, who knows? But it's unlikely. Um, and before he went to... Um, Ordain. I think he was already ordained, or he'd started his training in one of the monasteries, but then he felt like, maybe before I take the full step to full ordination, I should just get this lust and this passion out of my system. You know, this idea that by indulging we get something out of our system. So he went down to Bangkok, disrobed, and he just did whatever he wanted for like a week or so, and indulged completely in all the sensual pleasures, thinking, you know, I'll do it for the last time, then I'll ordain. But he went back to the monastery and, uh, and did ordain, amazingly. But he said it put his practice back three years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this is sometimes the price we pay. So it's really not worth it. Yeah. And again, you know, we, we don't carry on getting the same amount of pleasure that we got the first time round. We need increasingly bigger hits. You know. So we're very very tied up with the essential pleasures and they're not the way to freedom. So they're some of the dangers that the Buddha was mentioning, yeah? And the main danger is they keep us trapped in samsara. They keep us trapped in this cycle of suffering and suffering and suffering and suffering. And we're never coming out of it because we're not realizing we have to look in a different direction. Yeah. So we're actually empowering delusion we're clouding our mind and becoming more and more confused so anyway that's the negative side but the buddha actually defined suffering very nicely and i wanted to read it out in his words or at least in the translation of his words so he said what is suffering actually so he started from the beginning it's birth is suffering birth itself aging is suffering sickness death sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair a suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. Oh, here it doesn't say, but also usually in the definition it says um, separation from the liked is suffering, association with the disliked is suffering. And that's really interesting because, you know, most of the time we're not exactly where we want to be and this is how contentment can help. We can decide to be and to want to be where we are. We can actually give value to where we are. Yeah, so we're closing that gap between where we are now and where we want to be. This is the suffering, right? You don't have what you want right in front of you. But because you're looking for something else, you don't actually see the contentment, the happiness, the simplicity, maybe the ease of what's right in front of you. So we're looking always in the wrong place. Because the only experience you can have in life is what you're having right now. Anything in the future is just an imagination, it's a fantasy. Yeah, so this is very helpful in the practice, I think, to understand this definition and to see how developing qualities like contentment and peace can actually close that gap 
you know, and if you do continue to progress on the path, there are no more wishes. So how can you be separated from what you wish for or not obtain your wishes? When you reach contentment, there are no wishes. Yeah? So this is how we start to undermine this suffering. So there are three um, really nice uh, different responses you can have to suffering, and I think Bhikkhu Bodhi was the one that pointed this out, but he said the first one, which is the usual one, is to try and get rid of suffering. Yeah? So we don't like it. We immediately try to get something better or push it away. And this actually empowers it because you're giving it a lot of attention. So whatever you put your energy into, actually, you're growing it in your mind. You're putting it in the center of your mind and making it the entire thing that you're focusing on. Yeah? So we're trying to get rid of it, but unfortunately we're building, we're creating, we're increasing the suffering. So it's like the yeast that gives rise to the bread, you know. It just grows that bread. In India you have these chapatis, flat things, and they call bread double roti. So the little ones are like roti, and then when you add the yeast it becomes double roti. So this is how we make double suffering, double dukkha. We have the suffering and we say, I don't like this, this is wrong, it shouldn't be this way. So that's what we're usually doing. And Ajahn Chah called that the suffering that leads to more suffering. And then we have this second way, which is to develop a kind of psychologically healthy attitude to it. In other words, right intention that the Buddha taught. Yeah? So again, making peace, developing kindness, non-violence in the way we approach our mind and our experience. Yeah? Compassion, loving kindness and contentment. Contentment runs through all of those different intentions. And letting go as well. Yeah? Just accepting that this is the way it is right now. I don't have to identify or over-identify with it. I can just examine it with curiosity. So we develop this really healthy relationship. And that is called suffering that leads to the end of suffering. Yeah? And then the last one, which I think is very profound, is to actually realize the full extent of suffering and the pervasive nature, that it actually stems and runs throughout existence. So this is why the Buddha said, birth, aging, death is suffering. It, it, it's part of life. He also said the five aggregates, the five aspects of what we take to be a self. Body, mind, uh, body and mind in brief is enough for now. Yeah, this in itself is also suffering. So when we realize this, and this sometimes comes at a later stage in the path, um, we really uh, learn to align our whole life with the Eightfold Path. We make a concerted effort to end suffering once and for all. But the path is a gradual path, and we start where we are, and we start by developing this healthy attitude towards what we experience first of all. And it's the happiness that we develop through this and the contentment that gives us the strength to look more and more deeply into these things. Because we don't want to push our mind into areas that are difficult too early. Hmm? So the Buddha really talked about cultivating the path from the beginning through things like virtue, sense restraint, um, contentment, living a simple life, living a wholesome life, so that we get a kind of happiness that we can start to recognize, which is a little bit purer than the ordinary happiness and the agitated happiness of sense pleasures. And he called that anavajasukha, that means blameless bliss. Sometimes we don't notice it, but it, it is there if you look carefully. Sometimes we're just looking for the wrong thing. We're looking for the big hit. Yeah. So then the Buddha talked about the causes of suffering. And he said it's that very same craving that looks here and there, you know, into past and future, different places, different sides of the globe, for some kind of satisfaction. And he said in brief, it's the craving for existence, the craving for sensual pleasures, again, and the craving for non-existence. So that's quite interesting, because of course we all think we want to exist. But sometimes there's a craving in not, exi in not wanting to exist. Yeah? Because we suffer, we want to end suffering again. Yeah. But even more deep than that, I think, is that craving in itself is suffering. It's not that... You know, by craving we create suffering for ourselves. Sure, that's true. But craving in itself is unpleasant because whenever you're craving, you're not content with what you have. And um, my teacher, Adrian Brown, just told me a little... Um, it's not a very nice um, experiment, but they did an experiment uh, with some rats, unfortunately. Um, and they had these male and female rats, and apparently they could press a button, and the ma male rat 
could have a chase with the female. And for some reason or other, the females are very fast and there was no chance they could catch them. But apparently this experiment was to show that the rats wanted to chase each other just for the buzz. You know, even though they weren't going to get the object of their desire, the chase was just for the sake of a buzz. So there is a kind of hit in discontent, in being discontented, in looking for the faults. Because it makes us feel alive, it makes us feel that we exist. So sometimes we think we're attached only to happiness, but sometimes we can be attached to suffering too. And it's hard to put down our depression. It's hard to put down our fault-finding mind. We think by measuring, by judging, we can actually correct things and have a happier life. But it's that measurement and judgment that keeps you so busy and so caught up in life. Always trying to improve yourself, always trying to change your partner, your parent, your child. Yeah, instead of just giving them the love they need to grow into who they are and feel accepted. And there's nothing more beautiful than being around a being who fully accepts and embraces you as you are. I'm very fortunate to have that experience with my own teacher, Ajahn Brown. I feel fully accepted. Even one of the first things he told me early on when I met him was that I, ha I have his trust and respect. He just looked at me and said, you have my trust and respect. And I was so blown away by that. You know, here's a, a really senior monk with very deep meditation practice telling me he respects me. And that's the extent of humility that these beings possess, you know, and this ability to see the good in all beings. And I think especially when you have cultivated your mind, the Buddha also, having, you know, himself become awakened, he realized that this is a potential we all have. All human beings can become awakened, and that's why he taught out of Anukampa. That's the name of our project in England, our little uh, bikuni project to try and start a monastery for nuns. And that's the reason I called it Anukampa, was because it's one thing having a Buddha who gets enlightened, but imagine if he hadn't taught, we wouldn't be here now, we wouldn't have a chance to practice the path. I don't think any of us would have the wisdom to discover that path ourselves. But thank goodness he did teach for the benefit and welfare of all beings. And he had the foresight to understand the beings now, you know, 2,600 years later, who would still resonate with these teachings, because these are basic truths of reality. You know, they're timeless, akaliko. So they transcend race, religion, gender, you know, generations. It doesn't matter. When you hear the Dhamma, sometimes you get a taste for it straight away and you have a sense, yeah, this is leading to something. So the way out of suffering, just in brief, because we're going to talk about this um, in another talk, but the way out of suffering is the ending, the fading away and cessation of that very same craving. And the Buddha described it as, um, you could say, four ways of letting go. Chaga, patinisaga, muti, analia. And those words are very beautiful. They mean like chaga is like giving up or giving away or just giving, plain giving. So instead of sitting down to meditate and thinking, right, what am I going to get now out of this session? We just sit down to give. We give our attention. We give our care. We give our time. We give our heart to the breath or to the body, whatever you're experiencing. or Whatever needs some attention, you give of yourself. Yeah? So you can just sit for the sake of sitting. Or as I said the other night, sometimes if you know, I know that my mind's not really going to settle, I say, well, never mind, I'll just give this time anyway because it's a gift to the Buddha or it's a gift to my teacher <coughs> or it's just a gift to the people who are supporting me you know, as a monastic because I live on the donations of others. So I have a certain duty, but not in a sense that I'm forced to do it, but I'm inspired to practice because people are putting their hopes, you know, in the practice of good monastics that we will then be able to share the Dhamma and bring a little bit of a relief of suffering for other people. So, you know, this is the main thing that draws people to the practice, especially in the West, because most of us are not coming from a traditional Buddhist background. So we're first of all interested in, like, how can these teachings help me in my life? If they don't help me, what's the point? So... I practice for that reason, you know, I practice not only for myself, but so that I may have an opportunity to help others, even a little bit. I mean, one of the things that I had to um, struggle with a little bit when I got here was the idea of live streaming these talks. So this isn't live streamed, but it is videoed, and it's only the second video or something like that that I've done, third maybe. 
And I had to get over that because it's not my natural kind of arena. I didn't grow up in the public speaking forum. In fact, at school I used to hide when the teacher asked you know, for a presentation. And I somehow got away with it, always. So I never had to say anything in public and I'd go bright red if I had to. But what motivates me is the idea that even one person might benefit from this. It doesn't matter if the rest of you don't like it. I'm content. Well, sort of. <laughs> These two know I'm practicing with that. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't really matter in the end. It's just kind of the sense of self, getting concerned about how it appears, what people think, how people perceive us, and we cannot control others' perceptions. It's impossible. Also, others' perceptions change constantly, you know. What one person thinks about you one day is different the next day. You know, what two different people think about you are completely opposite. So, I mean, who's correct? None of us are correct. And we were just talking earlier today that our own understanding of ourselves has an even bigger kind of disparity between how we perceive ourselves and how others do, you know. (laughs) It's sometimes just such a mismatch. So we're very... It's hard for us sometimes to see our goodness. And I think, you know, this is one of the trainings that's really important. But before I get into all that sort of stuff, I do want to get back to um, defining happiness and suffering... So the next part is to define happiness. And this is very beautifully um, stated in the Majjhima Nikaya 139. So as I said, the Buddha said it's very important not only to understand suffering, but to actually pursue happiness. But you have to know what kind, right? So it's not only the goal, the final goal, it's part of the path, the whole path. And we're going to go into that further this afternoon, how to refine the wholesome kind of happiness and how to bring that up in meditation. Um, But for myself personally, I started again, um, I guess my spiritual path started when I went to India and I was only 19 and um, I was looking for something. I didn't know what. I certainly didn't think of myself as religious and I still don't, although I am a, a Buddhist, I have to say, and I love the Buddhist teachings. But I don't think he taught a religion. For me, he taught a path and an end of suffering. Yeah, it's a practical path. So we can have some confidence in that, and it's good to remain open to things that we can't yet verify through our personal experience, but we don't have to believe anything. It's an exploration, so it's a lot of fun. So when I first heard the teachings, the immediate response I had was a sense of relief, as I said. you know, There's, gosh, nothing wrong with me, and maybe this suffering that I've been through can actually be a kind of fertiliser for the seeds of wisdom and compassion. So maybe there's a meaning to that after all. And I was on a high for actually years. I mean, I carried on to practice, and I I served and sat many, many um, retreats in the tradition of Goenka, so they were the hardcore Vipassana retreats. But I got so much pleasure from that because, you know, you would really meet your kind of mind (laughs) and the way it responded to the changing sensations emotions moods and start to see that all these things were just in a flux in a flow and constantly changing and it really took away the kind of um, investment in that and I developed a, a much more stable kind of equanimity and it was interesting because I noticed that you know now I had a purpose, and that gave a meaning to my life. So I didn't need to find meaning in material things in quite the same way, or in the rock clubs that I used to go to, or the, you know... Well, I didn't get to see Led Zeppelin like my other two teachers did. Uh, they're my favourite. But anyway, <laughs> you know, rock uh, concerts and stuff like that, because I had a meaning. And because I had a meaning, I could simplify and, and it's really wonderful coming to the texts now because they're describing the process of my own um, spiritual practice evolving. It's not something I have to try and struggle to understand intellectually. I saw for myself that having done that retreat, I started to naturally observe Sila. I didn't need to break my precepts anymore. And I didn't even need to listen to things like music. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I was a music addict. <laughs> That's what I would have done. I'd have been a rock star if I wasn't a nun, (laughs) maybe, (laughs) and I'm glad I didn't, because that would be probably a slope into all sorts of, you know, drugs and sort of wrong, yeah, unwholesome behaviours, but um, yeah, I I just realised that I didn't need even to stimulate my sense as much anymore, because I was in India, and it was already fascinating enough, you know, I was learning so much, I wanted to be on the local buses with the chickens and the goats, and have my ears, ears and eyes open, talk to the local people. It's amazing how well you can talk to people without the same language. 
just through gesture and kind of through the heart. You want to connect and you just, you know, manage to convey a sense of love and interest toward the other person. And, and yeah, so, so my life simplified. And here in, um, in the gradual training, which I was going to talk about somewhere yesterday, um, the Buddha actually says that contentment is something that follows virtue. It's a part of virtue. So the way he describes it, it says here, that after one already observes some virtue, he said um, that one becomes contented, just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. So too, the bhikkhu or bhikkhuni becomes content with robes to protect their body and with alms food to maintain their stomach. And wherever they go, they set out, taking only these... Isn't that a lovely simile, you know, just this idea that you're so free like a bird and because you don't have any baggage and, you know, weight, luggage, you can fly much higher. And that's how I felt all those years in India. I was gradually simplifying and I would, you know, carry less and less with me. I'd have like six kilos on my back. This was before ordaining. But, you know, it's just a natural process to want to keep simplifying. And I used to live, you know, in India in like simple huts, sometimes local houses in the hills like far away from even the next small village. I remember once sleeping in a tea shop overnight, (laughs) just on this kind of very hard bed, and having all these beautiful pine trees around me in the morning. And I would be so contented with this. You know, now I look at some old photos and I think, did I sleep on that bed? That looks horrendous, you know, really old and grotty pillows. And, you know, this is a luxury, what you have here. But I was so happy, it just didn't matter. And it was actually wonderful that it didn't matter. It gave me confidence. You know, it gave me a sense that I could let go of a bit more and a bit more, you know, and maybe a bit more of my mental baggage too. So this contentment is, you know, part of the sila, part of the virtue, and it happens naturally. And then, of course, I refine that happiness into sort of continuing with the practice and noticing the joys of meditation. Yeah, so none of this was a judgment saying, oh, those happinesses are bad and wrong and evil. It was just like if you've been playing with toys as a child, that's not interesting anymore. You know, you get onto the Lego or whatever. You can get really complex Lego these days. But after a while, that's not interesting. You get into books, you know, or you get into whatever it is. So you just gradually move on as you start to get a different taste for what pleasure means. So the Buddha said, in um, reference to happiness, he said, one should know how to define pleasure, and knowing that, one should pursue the pleasure within oneself. Right? So don't think meditation has to be suffering, and you'll only get somewhere if you get up early, hurt your body, um, get a headache, you know, drag yourself into the room no matter what. That's not the case. You know, you can do a lot of work before you even get onto the cushion, you know, the way we were hopefully in the break by making sure that the defilements don't come in and that you start to perceive things in a way that uplifts the heart. And by the time you get to the cushion, you can start to develop happiness, at least by noticing what's there and not fighting it, right? So then the Buddha defines happiness further, and he says that um, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, that's unwholesome states of mind, One enters upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third and the fourth. Now, it doesn't happen like that, as fast as I just read it, definitely not. This is a very, very long and gradual training, and it's great to have a strong foundation, because these things come in their own time. Our job is to put the causes in place and let Dhamma decide, let Dhamma just take over, right? Get out of the way and let Dhamma unfold in its own time. So he called these kind of happinesses the bliss of renunciation, that's nikama sukha, the bliss of seclusion, paviveka sukha. That's more than just the seclusion of body and mind, kaya and chitta viveka. Paviveka (coughs) sukha means secluded from the five senses. You're so deep inside yourself that you don't even feel or hear anything. You know, you're just inside with the pleasure of the mind. So this is very deep stages of samadhi, of stillness when everything settles down and the winds of discontent stop blowing you off the object, yeah? So you've long since settled that. And then he called it the bliss of peace, upasamasukha. That means deep peace. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, to think of peace as a bliss. We sometimes think of peace as a bit boring, but these are deep, empowered, very bright pieces. Pieces, Hmm. types of peace. 
And then the interesting one is he called it the bliss of enlightenment. And he's referring here to the jhana states, the samadhi states. So it's not enlightenment. But the reason is that because it's so close to the bliss of enlightenment. And also when you develop such deep states of mind, the hindrances are really overcome for that period of time. And you're so much closer to seeing things as they really are. As I said, sometimes we need a strong and empowered mind to be able to penetrate the truth. Firstly, because the truth can be challenging. So it gives us that happiness, that um, sense of, um, how would we say, confidence, but also stability and real objectivity. Yeah. So we'll get into that further in the retreat. But what I did want to say about this is don't worry if this seems really far away from you, because it's far away from most of us, you know, and we're all practicing. But we should know which direction we're moving in. And then the Buddha gave something called the gradual training, which I started to mention just now with the virtue and the contentment. This is the first two steps or near to the beginning of the gradual training, having gain confidence in the Buddha's teaching. We start practicing like this. yeah. So we start to generate these wholesome happinesses, even at that level. And then also the happinesses that come through guarding the senses, you know, through learning to perceive ourselves and other beings in a slightly different way. So the Buddha says not to grasp at the signs and features. That means kind of not to obsess on particular things that you see in a person or in yourself that aren't very helpful to your mental development. <laughs> yeah. So you see a person and you just only can see their faults. This is not helpful. So we have to look at them in a different way. Find any other way you can to look at them. In another um, sutta, the Buddha says one of the ways to overcome anger is like, you imagine that anger is like moss covering a pool. And you, know, you have to separate that moss so that you can see the water underneath and drink from it. So he said in the same way, if somebody's um, verbal actions are impure, but their physical actions are quite pure, then focus on the physical actions. You can focus on them and almost ignore the other side. Just, oh, well, you know, they've had a bad day or whatever. Maybe, you know, they didn't really mean it the way they said it. But look, they made a really nice lunch for everybody today. and, And we focus on that. And focusing on it can also mean empowering it by praising the person, by acknowledging their strengths. So instead of constantly going around criticizing each other and telling each other where we have to improve, what about just saying, I see this in you, which is really admirable? Because that uplifts a person and gives them confidence. And you'll find they start to trust you. And because they trust you, they actually start opening up about their weaknesses. Maybe they'll come to you and ask for advice. And that's the best time to give feedback. When somebody actually wants it and they're receptive and open, they feel safe. So we criticise each other and ourselves far too much. We also have this thing called the inner tyrant going on inside us. I mean, that's a kind of popular word that's come up in insight meditation circles. And I think it's important to recognise that the inner tyrant is not a thing. It's more a um, pattern of thoughts, dysfunctional thoughts, which consolidates suffering. You know, the kind of I'm not good enough, I'll never get it right, I'm going to give a really rubbish talk, I can't do a talk as well as I did one on Wednesday evening, for example. You know, and all these kind of thoughts that, uh, that just bring us down and make us miserable. Like, exactly what's the point of that? You know, and are they true anyway? If they're not, and if they're not helping you, why keep them? Can we let them go? Again, you know, the third noble truth, letting things go, freeing Freeing, giving away, giving up. Yeah? So it's important to start to do this, and this is something that can be done in daily life. Yeah? The Eightfold Path is a path that, um, that applies to every aspect of our life. And that's beautiful when we start to understand that, because we stop thinking of meditation and daily life as two different things. Everything is a chance to practice. It's just that some situations give you more of a chance to cultivate certain strengths. So here we have the opportunity to develop calm. And the whole meditation um, weekend, I'm very happy if you'd practice the way you're used to practicing in whatever tradition with whatever method you want to. But um, I guess my focus is on looking at the direction things are moving in. So like we said yesterday, if it's really the Dhamma, it should lead towards... um, sort of turning away, dispassion, peace, yeah? 
if you use just these as a sort of marker, contentment, we can include again contentment there. If it's leading towards this, then you're on the right track. So make the intention, the attitude, the way you regard experience, the most important thing that you're looking into for this couple of days. And I'll give some instructions and guidance on how to start to approach things like the breath, to start to still the mind. But it'll be a bit different, maybe, from the way it's been taught in other places, perhaps, you know, where we just go straight onto the breath and try and hold it. Instead, we're just going to develop the causes for the mind to be still enough to see such a refined thing as a breath. Because the breath is very delicate and gentle, and we want to invite it into our mind. So we create our minds as beautiful places to be, first of all. Beautiful places where the breath wants to come in and stay. And then if you find your mind going onto the breath naturally, just really treat it with a lot of respect, valuing it, really valuing every single breath as if it's a very um, long-lost friend that you haven't seen for a while. Yeah? So you want to treat them with the best possible oolong tea. <laughs> this is one of the looking traditions here. We have this nice oolong tea from time to time. In, uh, I think it's the, uh, is it the Korean style or the Taiwanese style? Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. Little tea ceremony. So it's really beautiful. And again, you know, we start to see, okay, you could call it a sensual pleasure, but it's more refined than kind of drinking really strong coffee or tea, black tea. <laughs> and we start to taste all these little subtle undertones and fragrances that maybe we didn't notice before. So in the same way with the breath, you know, when it comes in, don't just think, oh yeah, boring breath, where's the next breath? Where's the breath co-joined with bliss? I'm supposed to be on the blissy breath. No, you know, the breath you've got is absolutely perfect. And if you just stay with that, it'll start to calm down all on its own. So Ajahn Brahm always says contentment is right in the centre of whatever you're experiencing. So just go deep inward, inward, inward into the centre of things and find contentment there. So I think that's enough for now because uh, you have another work period soon, but forget about that. So now we're going to uh, gently stretch your body and we'll sit down for a few minutes in meditation.